Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Making the Case for Early STEM Learning. My name is Susan Hope Bart, and I am going to be your host today for this webinar, and I am the Training and Education Manager here at TechSoup. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our platform that we use for our webinars, which is ReadyTalk. What you should see on your screen right now is a slide that says using ReadyTalk, and in or on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a chat box. The chat box is for you to use to chat in all of your questions, whether they're related to any of the presentation or if you're having any difficulties with the audio or visual. Please don't hesitate to chat and ask us how we can help you. If you lose your internet connection, you can simply reconnect using the link that was emailed to you, either when you registered or in any of the reminder emails that were sent out over the past week and then again this morning. If you lose your phone connection, you could always redial the phone number and rejoin. We are recording this presentation, so for those of you who missed part of it or have to step away, no worries. We will record it and post it on our archives on our TechSoup website where you can also find all of our past webinars. Usually we produce this in about a week. You can find that at www.techsoup.org slash community slash events slash webinars. We also have a YouTube channel where we, you can also view all of our recorded webinars and videos at www.youtube.com slash video. You will receive an email with a link to this presentation and along with any other collateral information or resources that we discuss in about a week. So um, if you miss anything or if you can't find the reminder email that was sent about an hour ago, don't worry, we will send out the presentation again. If you did register within the past hour, you should have received a reminder email. And on the right-hand column of the email, underneath downloadable files or downloadable documents, there are two links. And those are the presentations for today. You can also tweet us at TechSoup or use hashtag TSWebinars. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, Chatel Singh um, is with the Early Learning Lab, and she's amazing. She's super knowledgeable and full of enthusiasm. She works to build the capacity for innovation and the use of new technologies for preschools and community-based organizations and she works with families of children birth to age five. Her work at the lab builds upon 15 years of experience in digital media and technology to solve social problems. Julie Sweetland is an associate linguist and vice president for strategy and innovation at the Frameworks Institute, where she leads efforts to diffuse the organization's cutting edge, cutting edge evidence-based reframing recommendations through the nonprofit sector. She has led the development of powerful learning experiences for nonprofit leaders and has provided strategic communication guidance for advocates, policymakers, and scientists. And her work has appeared in publications such as the Journal of Sociolinguistics, uh, Educational Researcher, and Education Week, which I get emails from. Uh, she is a graduate of Georgetown University and completed her MA and PhD in linguistics at Stanford University. And she has prepared an amazing presentation for today, and I know you'll enjoy it. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Susan Hope Bard here at TechSoup. And also on the back end is Becky Wiegand. She is our webinar program manager, and she will be assisting with chat in the back end. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Um, or if you're having any difficulties with the technology. Before I turn it over to Chatel, I do want to chat a little bit about TechSoup. Some of you that are coming today may be new to TechSoup. Uh, TechSoup is headquartered in San Francisco, California. Um, I'd like to know where some of you are from. Go ahead in the chat box, test out that chat box. Go ahead and tell us the city and state that you are joining us from. And while you're doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about TechSoup. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Like some of you that could be joining us today, we work to empower organizations around the world to help them get the latest tools, skills, and resources to help them achieve their mission. And you can see from the map here that we serve almost every country in the world. 
and we have 62 partner NGOs from around the world. And our impact, we have helped organizations get more than $5.4 billion in technology products and grants. And these tech products and grants come from more than 100 corporate and foundation partners. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about TechSoup and how you can connect with all of our free webinar events and also be able to access some of our online courses. Um, with that, I do wish to turn the presentation over to Chatal from the Early Learning Lab. Chatal, welcome. Thank you. Um, it is so great to be here and to be speaking to so many of you. I'm just going to speak for a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about the organization that I work for, the Early Learning Lab. We are an Oakland, California-based nonprofit that is dedicated to supporting the early childhood education field. We work with both preschools and community-based organizations, libraries that support families of children from zero to five. We believe that all children deserve the chance to grow, learn, and fulfill their potential to be creative thinkers and doers. And the best way to support that is by investing in the adults, the teachers, the parents, the caregivers, and the community leaders who care for them. Um, and we, we really try to pull from techniques and tools from the social innovation sector to bring those strategies to those adults in the lives of children. We focus on technology because we really do feel that it has the potential to reach all children, all, all parents, and all schools in the country and bring um, accelerate the meaningful work that, that um, community-based organizations and schools do for children. And we really look at our technology work on three different levels. So we work on the supply side, working with technologists who are building tools for schools and for community-based organizations that are supporting families, making sure that the products are research-based and that they really meet the needs of the people who are working in the field. We also work on the demand side, and that is um, working with nonprofits and, and schools to help them understand how they can best use technology to advance their mission, what the latest tools are, we do some uh, research and quality control and just make sure that they don't have to spend all their time going through product catalogs. We, we can do that research for them. And then we also believe in bringing the latest uh, research to people who are working in the field, really bridging that research to practice gap. And we have been so fortunate to partner with TechSoup to produce this series of webinars that really uh, looks at how technology is being used in the early childhood field and bringing that to the people who are working with children and families on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, our last webinar was um, focused on media mentorship and fostering early literacy. And we thought for this one it would be really great to spend some time talking about early STEM and really making the case for science, technology, engineering, and math for young children. Um, so overall, back to our technology work, um, these webinars are one of the products that we've been bringing to the field. Um, please stay tuned for more events and more webinars coming up in 2017. Uh, we have a lot of exciting work uh, around the corner, and you can keep up with us at our website, which is earlylearninglab.org. And with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Julie from the Frameworks Institute, who has this fascinating presentation put together for you, and I hope you enjoy it. Great. Thanks, Chital, and thank you, Susan, uh, and TechSoup and Early Learning Lab for reaching out uh, to us and, and uh, inviting us to share what we've been learning uh, with your community so, um, so it can be of use. Um, so the topic today is making the case for early STEM learning. As already mentioned, I'm from the Frameworks Institute. The Framework Institute is a nonprofit uh, think tank that, uh, that investigates the communications aspects of scientific and social issues. 
So we work on a range of issues, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit later, um, but we are um, delighted to have this chance to share what we've been learning about how to talk about STEM, um, and particularly in the context of, of early learning. So we get up every day and think about frames. What is a frame? Uh, a frame is, frames are sets of choices about how information is presented, strategic choices about what to emphasize, how to explain it, and what to leave unsaid. Those are some of the most difficult um, decisions about how to talk about a, a topic. Um, uh, they are decisions that you need to make regardless of the audience you're talking to or the kind of genre you're working in. Are you writing a grant proposal? Are you reaching out to parents? Um, are you, you know, giving legislative testimony on the topic? So you're, you're always framing a communication uh, uh, regardless of the uh, situation. Um, so our, our point of view is that you're always framing, so you should always frame strategically. And we see that as an empirical kind of, of process. Uh, we are a group of researchers, so we're a staff of about 20 uh, PhD level uh, researchers from across the social sciences. Um, as I mentioned, I happen to be a sociolinguist. We have other linguists on staff, um, political scientists and sociologists who help us think about the structures and systems that language is being used in, anthropologists and psychologists that really bring to bear a sense of culture and, and the way people's minds work in processing uh, communication. And all of our work is intended to be used by advocates on uh, various social issues. Uh, so we're not just doing this research for research sake. We've all kind of fled the ivory tower and landed at this particular nonprofit because we want our research to be really useful and applicable Pardon me, for people that are, are uh, doing, you know, uh, writing websites and, and framing tweets on a, on a given date uh, basis and, and really working in the institutions that, that make our society um, strong and resilient and, uh, and have a strong civic body. So we bring that to bear on lots of different kinds of issues. Um, our organization is probably best known for uh, the work we've done has been really advanced by the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. So if you happen to have heard uh, phrases like brain architecture or toxic stress, or heard the argument that uh, we can invest now in early learning or pay more later in the form of increased social costs, those are metaphors and principles and data points that have come out of our long-term partnership with the Center on the Developing Child and the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, and they're really uh, leaders in the field and, and really showing how to bring science into thinking about uh, policy. Uh, we start, started a lot of that work with them, but, but the way we work as a nonprofit is to take the research that we do with one group and, and spread it to other networks. So, uh, you know, if, if uh, we worked with Harvard to translate the science of early brain development into metaphors like brain architecture, but the Kids Count Network, which is operating in, in every state and many of the territories uh, to do legislative advocacy on children's issues, they use those frames. Uh, the research I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about today was sponsored primarily by the Noyce Foundation, and it was specifically focused on how to make the case for STEM learning, uh, but it's especially um, informal STEM learning, and how can in STEM learning in informal spaces like zoos or aquariums, science centers, after-school programs, libraries, how can those spaces be seen as a, a complement to and a necessary piece of a STEM learning ecosystem and not just an afterthought or a nice extra where the real learning happens in school? Um, so uh, that's what I'll, I'll dig into today. Um, and just a, a, a quick shout out to some of the folks in the informal science settings. Um, you know, we, we do quite a bit of work with zoos and aquariums. Uh, the National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation, that's a, that's a project where uh, the live interpreter, the interpreters are in front of their live exhibit standing in an aquarium in front of the kelp or the penguins and have learned to make those um, interactions with visitors a teachable moment about climate change. And that was a project that, that found its uh, root in the INLS grant, which uh, many of you are probably familiar with. Um, so uh, we get up in the morning and think about how to talk about dire social issues uh, like children's equity and, uh, and climate change, and we, we go to bed happy because we know that by changing the way we communicate about these topics, we can really engage the public in a more productive way and, and create uh, real change for folks. Um, so our work often of who we work with and, and who we are, our work 
often begins when our partners realize they have a problem like this. They're saying one thing, A, 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 and based on how the, you know, the comment that comes back from the group or people's responses, they realize it's as if the public had heard B, B, B. Something was getting lost in translation. An example of how this might play out um, on issues of early STEM, uh, someone, might, uh, someone like you might say science literacy is just as important as the traditional literacies of reading and writing, and we need to promote those literacies in the early years. And the public is likely to react with something like this. Well, science is important if you want to be a scientist, but little kids don't know what they want to be when they grow up. Early on, they just need the good old basics, you know, reading and writing and maybe some manners. Another example of this you say, they think phenomenon, saying something to the extent of every child is a natural scientist. They explore, inquire, and test what they learn. This is very common framing in the field. It's, it's absolutely true. It's an inviting kind of statement. I, I've said this myself before. Um, if you understand how young children work, uh, this is something you can, can observe and, and see that they're working through a, a scientific process of inquiry as they explore their world. Um, the public in our research is likely um, to react that, you know, uh, some kids are into science and for others, that's, that's just not their thing. A third um, kind of you say they think on the topic um, of early learning, uh, uh, early STEM learning might be, uh, you know, making a statement like this, that children need to engage with STEM concepts in multiple ways, multiple uh, times to really build up that knowledge and skills. And hey, after school programs can be a great setting for these kinds of important learning opportunities. When faced with framing like that, um, it's likely that the public uh, will have a reaction like this. Engineering class after school, kids just need any time just to be kids, they need to recharge. I don't see the value of them doing the same thing after school that they do in school. So these are representations of, of public opinion um, uh, that are formatted for us to be able to do this at the web, uh, uh, on a webinar. I encourage you, and we'll send you the links out afterwards to explore our multimedia message memo where you can see video of lots of different Americans across the country, across opinion groups, holding uh, re, you know, opinions like these or expressing thinking like this. Um, but I we'll, uh, uh, just wanted to make the point here that Communication is not a one-way street where you uh, are, you know, are just taking your message and, and transferring it directly uh, to a passive recipient. Um, but uh, people have prior assumptions, and those prior understandings, the ways they think about issues, um, it, it influences the way your communications are interpreted. So it's a little bit less about what you say and more about what they hear. And when we can anticipate what people will hear, we can be sharper in what we say. With that first kind of um, thought about framing and how to think about framing from the public's point of view and anticipate uh, the public's reaction, we'll go, we're ready for our first live poll. Susan, can you, uh, can you make it go? Absolutely, I will make it go. Thank you so much. And as a quick reminder to everybody that's on, we are recording this, so not to worry. We'll be sending out a link to the archive along with the presentations. Um, you should receive that in no longer than a week. So everyone on the call right now, um, this is your opportunity to participate. Uh, I'd like you to look at these assumptions, and which of these assumptions have you personally run into recently? And you can click on the one that you've run into recently. Yeah even for young children. STEM is only for kids who are into it. Or STEM is hard and playtime should really just be for fun. So go ahead and click in. This is just interactive. You can take your mouse and click on the one that you've heard or you've run into recently. And we're going to be able to show you the results. And I have about half the folks that have responded. Okay, great. So it looks like I'm going to give you about five more seconds. Mm -hmm. Five, four, three, two, one. And now you should be able to see the results. Wow, look at that, Julie. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it is um, 
not surprising to me um, as, as a researcher here that people both recognize these and that multiple ones are in play. Um, so that's a natural feature of human cognition. We have lots of different ways of thinking about a topic, um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's okay. So when we can anticipate these kinds of reactions, when we can predict, we can prepare. Um, so we'll, we'll, in the course of the webinar today, we'll talk about some ways to kind of um, sidestep these reactions, prevent these reactions. You can't argue people out of, uh, out of these sorts of things, um, but you certainly can navigate around them. Um, so the first thing uh, to think about is, is just anticipating these kinds of, of misunderstandings and remembering what the great, um, I think he was a social scientist, although I suppose he was a playwright, George Bernard Shaw observed that the biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has occurred. Um, so here at Frameworks, we, we take that um, biggest problem in communication, the, the fact that we can anticipate that when people are close to an issue, when they have new information, when they are putting these issues on the agenda, they have ways of understanding the issue that the public just doesn't have access to and isn't practiced in, in ways of thinking. And we can um, use the tools of social science to, to really build better ways of, of getting our points across. So um, we use multiple methods to come up with framing recommendations. Um, I'm just going to um, uh, lightly say what these are, and then we'll spend most of the day, uh, most of the time, uh, talking about what the recommendations are and how they work. I'm not going to show the evidence behind each and every recommendation, but absolutely feel free to ask questions um, if you're curious about that sort of thing. Um, but we, we, we work through a, a systematic process where we talk about we, we interview um, experts to see what are the main ideas that they want to get across, things like um, uh, when children are exposed to science, technology, engineering, and math early on, they develop the kinds of habit skills and mindsets that, that support later, more sophisticated STEM learning. Uh, we look at, to the public um, and do, uh, we basically send our anthropologists out into exotic locations like Baltimore and uh, Tucson um, and ask ordinary Americans um, how they think about these issues. We really probe deeply um, uh, for a couple hours to, to really dig into all the different cognitive tools they have for modeling these, these issues as a participant in our shared culture. We look at how the media and how advocates are framing these issues. What are the flame, frames that are in play that are um, feeding culture, that are influencing people's thinking? And then from that, with a lay of the land, we design specific tools like um, value statements, you know, this is about making uh, sure that our society is ready for tomorrow, um, or sometimes examples or explanations or metaphors. We take those tools out, uh, test them rapidly uh, through short on-the-street interviews, take them through uh, more rigorous trials uh, that it often include a large um, uh, nationally representative survey where we're testing frames head-to-head -head and against um, what we want them to accomplish. So are, are these frames working to build people's understanding of the issue? Do they have improved attitudes? Do they support policies that are in line with what the science is telling us on these things? So in this particular um, slice of the work where we looked at uh, the way people think about STEM learning, that body of research queried about six, uh, just over 6,000 Americans. We have a much larger body of research on how Americans think about early learning and early childhood development that probably uh, query close to 100,000 Americans at this point. And our work on um, education um, has involved about 35,000 Americans. So it's a pretty robust um, uh, sample of, of how Americans think and how we can invite them into updated ways of thinking. So one of the um, uh, you say they think uh, that we, we just talked about was the, the idea that, um, that early years, that STEM just isn't for early years. We saw in our, our thinking um, and, and how Americans, uh, in our investigations into how Americans think about these things, that a source of resistance uh, to early STEM is the sense that uh, we're cramming too much into kids' days, that they are, we're asking them to you know, learn at a younger and younger age. And, and that really betrays a, a fundamental misconception about how early development works. It's thinking about the brain as like a container 
Um, and when we are passive, we're pouring information into a passive receptacle. Uh, whereas if you understand early childhood development, you know, it's more um, they're an active process of learning through inquiry and exploration. So in talking about STEM, it's really important to avoid giving off in you know, cues that this is about providing information at a younger and younger age and instead find ways to, to teach the public that young children do learn through exploration and experience. One there's lots of ways you can do that. One particular tool we have found to be really helpful in helping the public understand what happens in early childhood development is the metaphor of brain architecture. This compares the process of early brain development to the building of a house. Um, it's built much like a house from the bottom up. I'll, I'll give you an example of what that means, bottom up, in just a moment. And it's an active process, just like building is an active process. I want to talk about the skills and concepts developing in the early stages of life, establish the architecture, the wiring, and the foundation that supports later learning. I'll note here that we found that, that really talking about architecture and wiring is a little stronger than talking about foundation itself. Foundation is a uh, word that happens uh, frequently. It's a high-frequency lexical item, if you'll permit me to, to go linguist on you for a second. Um, whereas architecture and wiring, we talk about a little less frequently and, and certainly not in the context of the brain, so it's got a kind of perk up and notice effect on folks. Um, but, when, but more importantly, when we recruit what people know about the process of building a house, into thinking about how young children learn, we are also recruiting some ideas that are really helpful for them. It helps them think, appreciate how and why early matters. It's not just a child passively um, um, sponging up, you know, experiences, um, um, but but rather that that there are certain things that are happening brain-wise in the, this year, I mean, in, in these early years. In talking about the brain um, and talking about experiences that, that foster skills, it expands public thinking beyond the way they typically explain why kids learn or don't learn. And that, that explanation usually starts and ends with parents or what we call the family bubble, this idea that everything that matters happens inside the home and nothing that happens outside the home gets into that bubble. And that kind of thinking, although parents are quite important, I, I don't mean to, to dismiss or, or um, uh, dismiss the importance of, of, of parents and family relationships, but what it does is it obscures the role that libraries play, community centers, early caregivers of, of all sorts. And so by making this a, a brain story, um, an experience story, it, it really helps people consider more ways that we can uh, shape society to foster early learning. And, and making the brain, getting, uh, making it something that is built over time where it can continuously be added to, it, it makes it very different than something that's like a container that once it's filled up, it's filled up, right? This can be an ongoing process that can keep happening. Um, so brain architecture helps to frame early learning as an active process of exploration and influence in lots of ways. Um, let me um, show you an example of how you might change your communications um, to, to use this, this insight. Um, so a typical metaphor that we see in the early childhood field all the time is milestones being kind of uh, the marker of, of how children develop. This is a very typical kind of messaging that the overall goals of children's development in science are to deepen their conceptual understanding of the world around them, to increase their comprehension of how science is practiced, and to develop their abilities to conduct scientific investigations. One of the most important things parents can do is to uh, to, to meet these milestones is to provide a, a supportive environment. So when I look at this as a framer, um, I see, uh, 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 obviously this is all accurate and true, but I see some framing um, hazards, some, some ways the public will interpret this that, that might not be as intended. If we are um, deepening, you know, deepening their understanding and their comprehension and developing their abilities to conduct scientific investigations. That last part especially, I see the public saying, I, I don't need my child to be doing experiments. You know, this is, um, you know, again, get kind of cramming too much too soon. 
Um, and then this last phrase here about the, one of the most things parent, important things parents can do, often we are talking to parents, and, and so it's natural to want to say um, what, what parents can do. But when we only call out parents, we are um, reinforcing the sense that parents are in this alone and reinforcing the narrative that all of it happens in the family bubble, which makes it harder for us to make a case for you know, strong libraries, great after-school systems, strong network of community-based, um, you know, uh, child care or child development providers. Um, so there's some framing shifting we can do. And of course, milestone means where it's a process where it's, um, it's predictable and we're moving forward. So that's the, the good thing about that metaphor. But it also says we have to do this thing before we do that thing, which lets us kind of say, well, I want to do the most important thing first, which can lead STEM. Um, you know, we want to wait for that later on before they, you know, after they get the good stuff and that's the, the most important stuff down. So brain architecture can help us um, avoid those framing, um, you know, the, the, the backfire effect that we might get. Um, we could talk about the developing brain and being wired over time through experiences. Initial or simple skills form the circuits that are bundled up into more complex skills later as children explore and grow. So here, it's not that I need to do this first and then that later. It's that these, these things are going to build on each other and be mutually reinforcing. So it's a little less sequential and a little less zero sum than a milestone. Um, when children are supported in exploring the world around them, and every, anyone can do that supporting in the way we phrase this here, it's not just parents, it could be, um, you know, other, other adult caregivers or others who interact with children. The architecture of scientific understanding is established. So again, I, we've, we've set the foundation here, it's not that I'm asking the child to master, you know, uh, uh, eight inappropriate skills uh, for the age, but, but I'm setting, you know, setting the architecture. Um, and as adults interact with children who are experimenting and asking questions, so if that is seen as an age-appropriate kind of thing that kids do, they're building the foundation for the ability to investigate problems scientifically. So same concepts as on the left, but reframed subtly um, in, in order to prevent um, pushback or and, and in order to reduce misunderstanding. A lot of these changes are subtle, and that's the key concept of frame effects, that small changes in how information is presented can lead to relatively large changes in how that information is understood, interpreted, and acted upon. Um, so avoiding filler up and advancing exploration and experience through brain architecture. The next kind of thing you want to avoid in an alternative frame to advance and we want to avoid this sense that we are either filling up the attention battery or draining it, right? And, and I just talked about filling up, but let me talk about the draining a little bit more. We found that Americans model children's attention span and their ability to learn as a lot like a rechargeable battery, that when they are intensely focused during the school day or in other formal settings, slowly their attention is draining and they need to um, recharge that attention battery by doing unstructured, free choice, um, non-academic, and quite frankly, people think about it as non-learning activities. Um, so after school, they need to go play sports or run around or just be kids, do nothing um, in order to, to be able to engage in that more effortful attention later. So again, this is zero sum. Um, uh, that, that, you know, learning happens in school and not out of school, um, that some kinds of things are, learning must be hard and effortful for it to even count as learning. If it's fun, it must not be learning. And with those things in mind, you can see how having STEM in informal settings in particular, um, Americans are likely to reject that. These uh, topics, um, are seen as, as hard, especially technology and engineering and math, as requiring lots of attention. And so why we would want to place those things into kind of free choice hour settings is, is really just, uh, it, 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 people can have trouble wrapping their minds around it, um, unless you kind of can provide an alternative frame for them to think about that uh, topic within. So, uh, you know, instead, can we talk about um, how STEM can really tap 
and fuel intrinsic motivation. Um, and that's a different way of, of thinking about what it takes to engage in STEM learning. The metaphor that we found to be very productive in helping people appreciate um, that informal learning sites have distinctive contributions, um, that learning can happen in lots of places, including informal environments, um, and that suppresses a zero-sum thinking about time. We need time for learning and then time for brain rest um, is, is this idea of activation. Um, that by talking about STEM learning experiences in the afternoons, the summer, or on weekends, where they can activate interest in these subjects by providing um, opportunities for children to really experiment, play with concepts, get hands-on, and be in, in real-world situations. Um, and this is, if you are working in an informal learning environment, um, I think can be really incredibly um, helpful to you in making the case for, um, for why your type of institution is a um, necessary and valuable contributor to the overall learning ecosystem and not just a, a nice extra. Um, so here's how you might use this particular metaphor. Um, I took here something from uh, the Association of um, Science and Technology Centers, which is quite accurately uh, researched, and I spared you the footnotes, but, uh, but the children who participate in informal STEM programs show higher school achievement in science and math, they report higher levels of interest in STEM subjects, and they're more likely to choose a STEM career. All true, all things that people are likely to say, yeah, I want that you know, for my kids, for kids in society. Um, but it's less likely to say why this, um, how it happens, and, and, and leaves people less equipped to think about what informal does that, that's different. It, it, you know, is this just because we get more of them, um, or is there something unique about this kind of setting? Um, so here's, here's something that, that kind of advances that we're tapping intrinsic motivation kind of, of thinking. When children participate in effective after-school programs, after-school STEM programs, they get hands-on experiences and have time to freely explore those subjects. This sparks their curiosity and allows them to build up knowledge over time. Activating a greater interest in STEM through such programs leads children to do better in science and math in school, and they may even become more likely to pursue a STEM-related career. Um, so lots of cues here for this activating kind of um, um, language, we've got sparking curiosity, activating, you could talk about fueling or turning on. These are all material kinds of metaphors. It's a little less of the mental metaphors about inspiring and motivating. They're, they're, they're con it's a concrete kind of metaphor with, with stuff in it that rubs against each other and makes things happen, uh, physical things. Uh, but that, that's an example of that metaphor and, and how it shifts attention from um, more of this is better, which leaves you open to too much is um, too much is too much, um, and, and instead um, the sense that more kind of sparks and, and, and generates things. Um, next, um, and um, Susan, is my audio okay? Yes, your audio is perfect. Okay, okay great. Um, Great. Next, we're going to talk about the difference between pies and cakes. I'm on the East Coast. It's time for lunch, almost time for dessert, so forgive this. Um, we, we want to avoid the sense that more STEM means less of something else, less reading, less, less um, math, um, and, and I know math is included in, in STEM, but we found the public really um, models it as science. Um, um, so much, and technology and engineering are seen as highly advanced. Um, people don't see how these, these four disciplines go together. Um, so more of STEM is going to mean less of something else that, that um, Americans, you know, kind of know to be valuable. Um, in the early years, that might be, you know, just time to, to play, um, morals or manners, coloring, ABCs, one, two, threes. Um, but the, the general sense is we want to, to avoid having STEM be in competition with, um, you know, taking a slice of that, that limited finite pie of time, and instead have it be something that can be thought of as like adding richness multiple layers to, to children's experience, and, and that we want those multiple layers and lots of experiences. A metaphor that we found helped accomplish that particular shift in frame 
was a metaphor of fluency or immersion. Um, the idea that, um, that just as people need to be immersed in real world situations to learn a language, children need to explore STEM concepts and use them to fully understand them and become fluent in these subjects. When we introduced this metaphor, we saw Americans say, yeah, you know, you need classroom learning and informal learning. They need to work together. Um, and the kinds of things you do, you know, I, I took French uh, for years, and that was great and really helpful, but I didn't really get it until I had to go to Paris and figure out how to get around the metro system, right? So that kind of, of thing people was the experience that people would, would talk about. Um, and, and so this let um, informal learning sites have a distinctive contribution without devaluing what the formal K-12 system can do. Um, it really sets up a, a formal system to talk about why hands-on applied experiential learning is important. It doesn't have to, to be about informal learning per se, but can rather be about uh, the need to use and, and practice with and have lots of experiences with um, certain kinds of concepts. Um, and, and we found that if this is a metaphor that's where people really understood learning to happen over a long period of time. It made time long and skinny for people, not a finite you know, clock uh, that was ticking, ticking, ticking. Um, and so that, that means it's less about that, that you know, we're taking a slice of, of a finite resource um, and more, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're making good and interesting use of an of a abundant resource. Um, so fluency might use it like this. Um, here's an example of, of, of a very typical um, advocacy communication. Young children develop science understanding best when given multiple opportunities to engage in science exploration and experiences through inquiry. The range of experiences is what gives them the basis for seeing patterns, forming theories, considering alternate explanations, and building their knowledge. This is uh, from a position paper from the NSTA. So it's authoritative um, for that particular um, genre for that particular communication context. This is the kind of communication that's, that's necessary um, for kind of saying what does the field um, know to be true and, and what is our expert position on it. But when asking people who aren't in the field to think about these topics, a metaphor can really help them get on the same page with the, with the field, with, with, the, with the people who are very you know, immersed in these issues. Um, so here's how to make those exact same points using this particular metaphor. Just as people speak a, a new language more fluently when they learn it over time and go out and use it, children learn a scientific concept best when they encounter the idea multiple times. When they have a range of experiences, they have a chance to notice patterns, come up with ideas about how things work, test them out, and consider alternative explanations. When children are immersed in investigating their world, they become more fluent in science. So we've got the, the analogy to language. We've used the word fluency and immersion. So that's the, the metaphor doing the work here. But there's also a plain language kind of effect, a cause and, and effect and everydayness to, to this reframing. So instead of the list of the range of experiences, you know, research showed us that this gives them the, the basis for seeing patterns, forming theory, considering alternate explanations, all those things that are true. But in a more, um, um, colloquial um, kind of framing that when they have a range of experiences, then kids have a chance to notice patterns, come up with ideas about how things work, right? That's a forming theory. So, so really um, using more accessible language that lets um, your audience um, uh, understand and access the, the expert information and not kind of staying in an expert register. So that's, that's two uh, framing tools um, that we're, we're modeling there. So. Um, if you have ever wanted to talk metaphors with a linguist, now is your chance. I'm going to check in on the question in the chat box. Um, and so uh, just, just went through three metaphors that we saw uh, to be useful. And I'll also see maybe there are other questions. Um, uh, Shital, did you want to um, um, queue up any questions in particular for me? Sure. Well, um, we have flagged a couple. There's one that just came up, um, Kristen. Mm -hmm wondering if the listeners are allowed to use your wording in presentations to stakeholders or press releases. What is the framework? Yes, 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 yes. Please use it. These are 
Um, these are open source concepts for your public facing communications. It is our nonprofit mission to, to be the huge communications backstop everyone wishes they had but can't afford. Um, and, and so we've done the, the hard work of, of testing these metaphors against other ones, figuring out why they work, what you're trying not to activate in public thinking, what you are trying to activate in public thinking. So please use these concepts freely. Um, we, um, you know, ask you not use them commercially, um, and we ask that um, if you are giving a presentation about, hey, here's how you should frame this, and you cite us, uh, you can see the full terms of use on our website. But if you're writing a brochure, giving, you know, making a slide deck to say, hey, here's why early STEM matters, please use this and, and don't cite us um, in that context because you really want uh, the words to, to be your own. You want to be the, you know, kind of the author of your own communication. Um, but yeah, they are open source concepts. Good question. What else? Great. And, and somewhat related, Matthew is wondering if there is an early STEM message brief available on hmm. a website um, that they can use. Yeah, we have tons of STEM messaging on our website right now. In terms of the early STEM, we do have something in production um, supported by the, the CUNY Center. Um, and, and I just don't know, it's not on our website right now, and I'm not sure when it's going to be published. So I'll say watch this space. Um, I know we have something in the works. And um, I will check in after this, and if it's available, I'll make sure that Susan sends it out in the, in the follow-up. So, Maybe stay, tone, stay tuned and we might have it right away. Thanks. Those, those are the questions that we have had so far. If anyone has another question, please feel free to chat it in. And um, while Julie continues her presentation, we could always circle back to the questions at the end. Okay, great. Well, I'll, um, I'll keep going. Um, all right, final avoid advance kind of um, idea. Um, the, um, we, we saw in public thinking that these subjects, science, technology, engineering, and math, were modeled as for certain kinds of kids. So let me say a little bit more about that. Um, First was just kids who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, we had people saying, well, I was really into science, but it's not everyone's thing. You know, some kids really love math, others, they just, they just hate it. Um, so it was seen as a topic where it really had to inv involve an element of free choice um, and affinity, um, and that that was kind of baked into kids. You either were that type or you weren't. Um, what we um, see experts saying is that we're creating these types or not um, by, you know, we're creating interest um, or, or snuffing it out, you know, based on the kinds of experiences we're learning. And we need to be fostering um, greater attainment and, um, in these subjects, you know, overall um, for, for, to, to meet the needs of the future. And we really need to start that work early because it does, you know, the, the trajectory is um, influenced by early experiences. Um, so one kind of type uh, that we saw the public hold um, was about, you know, innate interest, and and uh, and that has some some limitations in it. The other kind of typing we saw um, was when was was around uh, racial was around racial categories and gender categories. Um, advocates are right, rightfully pointing out that we have real disparities in, um, in educational attainment on these subjects um, that are, you know, African Americans are less likely to pursue STEM careers, less likely to hold those kinds of degrees. Um, women are not represented fully um, in STEM careers and degrees. And so we really need to really look at what's happening in the early years to, to address that. When presented with those kinds of ideas, uh, we saw Americans fall back on, on really stereotypes about those groups, um, that, you know, those things weren't valued in the home, um, that, that really, you know, those kinds of kids have other interests. And so we want to avoid framing that, that lets people stay comfortable in those assumptions and find 
framed, but let us make the case that STEM is everywhere and STEM is for everyone. This isn't limited uh, to certain types of kids. One strategy, um, and I can't do this topic justice on, um, in this format, so if this is something that this of interest to you, I want to encourage you to, to go and, and read the fuller research. Um, but one strategy that we use to kind of reframe from some types to for everyone was choosing, um, thinking about what kinds of examples of effective STEM programming we used. We tested four different examples. And I just want to be curious, uh, let's see, which one would you predict was most effective at building support for informal STEM learning and building support for the idea that STEM is for everyone? Just take a guess on which one worked best with the public. Um, Susan, can you make the poll go? Sure can. All right, so I see a lot of people, our fastest fingers are moving in 17, 18, 19 responses. Uh, we will give you another five seconds, four, three, people are rushing to get in their answers, two, mm -hmm. one. Okay, you can, wow, look at that. You know, so about, it's a, um, it's, oh, are you doing the little bar graph thing? Nope, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I do it? Okay. Yes, well, clearly you all should work on our staff. Um, Community Garden was the, the, the one that worked the best. I'll say a little bit about the, the, the others. Um, one, we selected them, um, particularly the programming apps and the robotics for kids, as examples to test because the field is using them so often um, that they are, um, you know, kind of um, very popular, uh, especially the robotics ones, examples of, you know, creative, innovative, forward-thinking kinds of, of experiences that, uh, you know, turn kids on to these, to these subjects. It's kind of a poster child uh, for, for the field in, in a lot of ways. Um, but we found a clear in a way that the community um, garden example um, had very productive frame effects um, for the public. It helped people think about, um, it really reduced their attitude that this is for some kids, and it increased their, their support for this happening um, in informal settings, for this being, you know, kind of more STEM, STEM all day, every day kind of thing. That this example has some very specific productive effects. Um, here's an example of how we, you know, how we wrote the example. Uh, here's an example of our example. Um, kids can learn many different intertwined STEM skills together. For example, in a setting like a community garden, students can conduct scientific observations on how the environment affects certain plants. So there we've talked about, um, um, you know, the, kind of the, the S. In, in STEM, the science and this biology in particular, right? They can learn how to leverage technology, which can be as simple as deciding using a shovel or a hoe or as advanced or setting up, you know, digital sensors to track key indicators. So again, define technology for the public as kind of selecting tools for task, uh, which is very different than how the public typically thinks about technology, which is as an object, right, a computer or a mobile phone. Uh, rather than as a subject, a way of, of thinking or a mindset, a set of skills for um, identifying problem-solving tools. They can think like engineers while building structures and systems for their plots. I think our original example, example actually had a, uh, a, t a stake, you know, for tomato plants. So again, it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, retrofitting uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, a very complicated kind of engineering um, uh, task, but it, that it can be uh, designing, you know, designing solutions for specific problems. And they can exercise their math skills by calculating rainfall, nutrients, or predicting the day that peppers will ripen. Because these learning environments are flexible and allow kids to explore their interests, after-school STEM programs are especially effective at reaching a wide range of young people, and not just those who already think of themselves as quote-unquote math and science kids. You can see how this particular example, as opposed to perhaps some of the other ones we talked about, programming, robotics, music, um, is easily, people can easily imagine it with very young children as well as older children. So 
one recommendation is that if you have to give people say, what do you mean by early STEM? If you've only got one example to, to you know, the chance to trot out one example, we would recommend that the field make more um, consistent use of this particular example as an illustration of how these um, specific uh, disciplines work together as a set, what makes STEM a thing, um, but also, you know, how it can be used in the early years. So this, this particular example is one that you all can feel confident and, and rely on. But it also has some effectiveness factors um, and characteristics that would let you, um, you know, think about, if, you know, how to make an effective example out of your favorite example, how to frame your favorite example more effectively. Um, so th the community garden example and other examples that we found to be effective are concrete, meaning people can visualize them. They're very kind of specific. Um, they're conceivable, meaning they seem um, easy to do. So we found that the um, music engineering, music production example didn't work well because people assumed it'd be very expensive and therefore couldn't happen everywhere or in every community. And that left them comfortable in saying, well, some kids will do this and some kids won't, right? Whereas a community garden example, because people could think about it as feasible and pretty easy to do, it had spillover effects on, oh, STEM is feasible and easy to do. Um, or, you know, at least doable, it's not easy. Um, it has causal change in it, what affects what kind of language, so not just a list of associated characteristics, but you can see in my example here that when kids can kind of muck around, then they get interest built. You can see that kind of what, what happens in this setting that leads to the outcomes that we're saying are effective. So there's some cause and effect kind of language, if this, then that. They're credible examples, so um, they're not seen as um, exotic. Um, they're not seen as, um, uh, you know, only happening, you know, in, under certain circumstances that have a, a certain um, reality check um, level to them. And um, a well-framed example will have collective benefits. Um, so it's not my community garden was great for these kids, but community, when we provide these kinds of experiences, all kids benefit, our society, our community is stronger, that kind of a collective sense. And it's seen as, as um, you know, going beyond the, the usual suspects. So um, that is um, the, the last specific recommendation I'm going to dig into today. Um, I want to just say that framing doesn't work like a switch. It's not a single thing that you can change, you know, and the advocate said, let there be light, and the public saw that it was good. It's framing as a, my, as a practice for your communications works a lot more like the sextant uh, below there in the corner there with lots of um, doohickeys, to use the technical term, that you need to fidget with and adjust to really navigate toward the understanding you know, you're trying to bring to, to the people you're communicating with. Um, so each of these frame elements and, and others that you can explore in our research, each have a small contribution to the overall frame you're trying to build. Um, in terms of resources that you can look at, you can definitely look at our website. Um, we have under education, there's a, a whole section um, um, on, on education, and you can find the STEM resources fairly easily, I hope. Um, I also want to point you to a, uh, a toolkit that we built in collaboration with the After School STEM Hub, which is an initiative led by the After School, uh, After School Alliance, but it involves lots of organizations, some, a few of whom I saw um, are represented here today, including um, the Y um, and, and, and um, uh, 4-H Boys and Girls Club. Some of the major youth-leading organizations are, are involved in this. Um, so this is a very, I, I hope, user-friendly kind of toolkit. So there are slides that you can steal um, and build into your presentations about um, why um, STEM matters. There's an animation um, that can be used in your presentations to really um, set up um, how uh, how STEM works. It's got, a, uh, I think, a pretty well done version of the community gardens example in it. 
um, some talking points which can out you can use to outline your your structure uh, structure your your communications. Um, even infographics that you can share to build the case for STEM um, on social media or in other settings. So I encourage you to, to visit our, our partners there and take, the, take whatever is there and, and use it. I'm going to slow down now and just pause and check in with the, with the, um, sorry, the um, questions. Uh, and we've got a good amount of time to, to have discussion. So ask me anything and everything that, um, that, that might have come to mind as we're working through this. Um, Chital, can you help me moderate oh, here? Um, yeah, we, we had a, a great question from Carol who was wondering about hmm. um, frameworks developing culturally and linguistically diverse metaphors for mm -hmm. early childhood caregivers who might not be English speaking, for example, and um, wondering if, if frameworks mm -hmm. has developed that. Ah, very good question. So all of our research is, um, is is sponsored, and like every nonprofit, we're on a, we're on a strict budget. Um, so this research was conducted um, in English. Um, it's not to say that it didn't include anyone uh, who is bilingual or, or speaks a, another um, language in the home. I would say that um, the the cultural and linguistic diversity um, that we have in our sample is on par um, with what we would see in the American voting of public. Um, so it is a limitation of the research. Um, this research was done in English, not in other, not in other languages. Um, that said, um, and, and we did not, did not have the, the opportunity to, uh, to really retest or, or do primary research in, in other linguistic communities. That said, I will say that um, a well-chosen metaphor can be an, a, a really strong tool for engaging people who speak a language other than English. Assuming that the basic concept, you know, the house, turning things on, um, or, or language fluency, right? Assuming that that concept exists, in their in their culture and their language, um, it can be a really great way to to bring them into an English language conversation on a topic. So this is you know um, you know how a lot of uh, English language instruction proceeds, right? It's, it's through the use of, of analogy and metaphor. Um, so I don't want to. Um, our evidence does not clearly prove that these particular metaphors work with lots of different um, uh, linguistically different populations. However theory about metaphor would suggest that these are better than guessing, right, and, and, and likely to have lots of, of good effects. I also notice here, Carol, that your question um, talked about the idea that um, the zero sum gain concept is, is you know, it's, it's, it's something that comes out of psychology and it's not it's kind of everyday speak. Absolutely agree with you on that. I'm not suggesting that people are walking around saying, I believe that you know, the, 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 in a limited day, school day, we have a zero-sum game between the basics and more advanced subjects, right? People aren't using that kind of language, but they are reasoning in that kind of way, right? So we, we, it's our job as researchers to pull out, hey, these folks are modeling this as zero-sum, um, and that has implications for, for how people talk about it um, to, to get them past that way of thinking. But, but no, I, I don't think anybody in our research sample used a, the, the, the word zero sum, although it was very clear that they were talking about, you know, you only got so much time in a day. Um, you know, you really have to make sure you get the basics down firmly before you do these more um, advanced things like technology and engineering. So they were thinking about it in that way, even if they weren't using that language. Good question. I hope that wasn't too much there. Um, can uh, I repeat the last slide? Let's pop it down. Oh, I, I have a question for you, Julie. Um, you know, what are, I, I love that the example of the gardening program as, as a concrete, believable way that um, children can be exposed to mm -hmm. STEM learning early on. If you are running a program, say in a library, mm -hmm. what would some um, activities or, or ideas of, of types of activities that a, a librarian might program to complement some of the more literacy focused um, programming that libraries provide? Include sure, yeah. play with blocks, um, kind of do the trick from a STEM point of view. Hmm. 
So if your communication task is to make a case for libraries as part of the STEM ecosystem, then the challenge you've got there is, is saying, why is literacy part of science and math, right? People think of them as compartmentalized, discrete subjects. So that's the, the framing challenge you've got is, is showing, you know, how these concepts help each other out. And so for that particular um, framing challenge, I don't know that I would go with an example as a solution to that challenge. I would go with something like fluency as, uh, as a, a, a framing tool that would help you build that challenge, that we need lots of kinds of experiences to get the concept. So, you know, we need to read an engaging book about pandas and bamboo to get this concept of how plants and animals work together and how they're paired in certain ways or matched in certain ways in ecosystems. And this gives us ideas that we can transfer to other kinds of similar concepts, you know, squirrels and acorns, um, you know, and, and so, and, and that, that's one kind of experience, right? The literacy experience adds a certain layer, adds to the fluency. It's, a, it's kind of a touch point, right, that helps scaffold up and, and build those concepts that, that need to be also played with in other ways. Um, if you're doing, you know, hands-on things at a library, um, you know, I just took my five-year-old to Lego Club at our library down the street um, two weeks ago. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that talking about the, the – the library as um, one of the points, you know, one of the kind of pollination points in a robust ecosystem of learning um, where all of these skills can be built would, would be an example, uh, another way to do it too, to so talk about the library as part of the, the ecosystem of STEM learning. Does that answer your question? It, it does. That was a great answer. Thank you, Julie. Hmm. Anyone else have questions for our presenter today? Or comments or reasonably phrased complaints? I'll take them all. Well, we, we have a new question um, from Tony who is asking about how you get parents to invest in their child by mm. writing STEM activities. And, you know, Julie, mm. I think that. This, this is um, really hitting hitting the central question of your presentation about mm -hmm. uh, about early STEM. Yeah, so Tony, that's a good question, and I appreciate that it's uh, an immediate challenge. Um, that if you you know if you're running one of these programs, you know what is it that will um, really make that program take off and have the resources at its disposal. Um, the particular particular question you ask, you know, will how do you get a parent to choose this over something else? I don't know that I have an immediate answer for that. Um, that that's it's not what our work is exactly designed to do. It's more providing the surround sound that makes that decision more harmonious and fluid for parents, makes it more likely to want to to kind of you know dance in that direction. So if the if if we can have a um, a, a, a society where people understand that um, active, engaged enrichment as in the early years matters matters for the long term, that these particular concepts you know that the STEM concepts are. Um, go together, they go with early childhood, um, they, they are built over time, right? That's the kind of cultural understanding that would make your program a yes, of course, not a maybe nice extra. Um, and, and, and that might lead parents to, to enroll in it um, at a fee, but it might open up sources of funding that make it unnecessary to have that point of purchase fee, right? It might create um, a space where 
where those kinds of opportunities are built in in lots of different ways. So I think that our work is the way we test it is saying this gets people to appreciate this stuff at a conceptual level. It gets them to support the kinds of policies that um, you know make sure you've got access to really well-trained, qualified staff to run that program, that there's funding streams that would support that kind of work. Um, but I don't know that I could, as a researcher, say, hey, if you talk activation, kids, you know, parents will sign up. I, I, I can't say that this does that. It might. Give it a try. Um, but, but that's not the, um, the, problem, the specific problem we're solving for. So um, I hope that wasn't too disappointing of an answer, but, but it was an accurate, an accurate one. And, and one I know people are, are constantly um, wrestling with, as, as, you know, if you're running that kind of program. All right, I want to give away one more pro tip if there aren't more questions, which is I have um, broken one of our own um, rules, I guess, not a rule. No, I've, not, I've done one thing that was not in line with our recommendations uh, throughout this part of the presentation, which is I've used the term STEM, um, and, you know, a lot um, and frequently and without a ton of explanation. And I'll just say that was one thing that our research found um, was not particularly effective with the public. So in educational circles, um, the, the acronym STEM has kind of become a word, um, and, and lots of people, um, you know, understand it as a thing. But we found the public had no idea what the term meant. Um, when asked to guess, they assumed it had something to do with stem cells and stem cell research. Um, and so I just want to caution everyone, um, you don't have to throw away the acronym, that was not, not but, but you do need to explain it early and often. Um, and explaining it isn't just saying this stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. That's, that's good, do that. But you want to use the acronym, say what it stands for, and somewhere in your communications, as often as you can, provide ways for people to think about how those four disciplines are connected, right? So these are the disciplines that have us look at data and generate hypotheses, test and learn, um, and, and, you know, look to evidence to, to solve problems. Those are the kinds of explanations you want to use. And there's a lot of um, examples for how to do that in the After School STEM Hub Toolkit as well as the toolkit um, that, that's, on, that's on our website. So that's um, my last goodie. I think that um, um, Susan um, had some, some more information to share if there aren't more um, questions now. Great. All right. Thank okay. you. Uh, All right. Well, thank it, you yeah, so if nothing much. else, thank you for, yeah, thank you for, for giving me the chance to, to share the work of our, of our team here. This is a, a great project to work on, and we've just found tremendous enthusiasm um, for these, um, you know, explanatory techniques um, in the field of, of folks who are working on advancing STEM learning in lots of different ways, and um, early childhood is a topic near and dear. Uh, to our, our heart here at Framework, so it's especially exciting to get to smash these two things together. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting us, and, and, and Susan, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, and folks still have plenty of time and opportunity to ask questions, and I do want to give a shout out to Sarah Beth. Sarah Beth, go to libraries. Um, she wanted to give a, just comment that some things and share what she does in the children's department of her library. Um, she's got a science math table full of things like magnets, counting bears, magnifying glasses, fake bugs, real bugs encased in plastic, mm -hmm. and the, the kids all go for it and stay for a long time, and they love mm -hmm. it. And that's a really nice story. I love when libraries do things like that and set such a wonderful example. Um, for all the folks that are still with us, please hang in there. We have a few more minutes. I have some other interesting information to share with you. And we also want to get some feedback from you. So of all the things that Julie went over today, and it was a tremendous amount of useful and engaging information, I'd like you to chat in one thing, 
one, I know, just relegate yourself to one thing. You can, you can chat too if you really want to, um, that you learned today or something that you're going to try to implement or something you're going to try to frame or reframe. And perhaps also consider how you're going to share this with colleagues or parents. So go ahead and chat that in as I move on to talk about a few other things that TechSoup offers. Um, and since I know we have a lot of folks on this call that are with libraries, I do, I do want to skip over to some upcoming free events that we have before going to our online courses. Um, but in a couple of weeks, we've got a one, two, three punch. We've got on the 15th of November, power up your data with Microsoft's Power BI. So if you're a beginner with data visualization and you want to see all the amazing things that Power BI can do, you can attend this. It is for beginners. So um, Jordan, the presenter, will be able to identify and define a lot of the terminology that is used in the data visualization world. We also have a Fix It at the Library with Do It Yourself Repair programs. It's a wonderful webinar. That's on Wednesday the 16th. And then on Thursday the 17th, we have How You Can Successfully Promote Your Year-End Fundraising Campaign. That's definitely a not to be missed event. And then towards the end of November, just before Thanksgiving, we've got five things you didn't know about TechSoup's donation programs. And for those of you that are new to TechSoup or you're just joining us, um, you've been, you were sent this link uh, by um, the Early Learning Lab or Julie's uh, community. We do want to tell you that we have some online courses that you can take. We have several free courses, and we are continuing to, to develop these courses. If you go to techsoup.course.tc slash catalog, you can find out more about these courses. Um, currently, we have a course in there for tech training. So for those of you that have to conduct, conduct training, in your workplace, whether it's a nonprofit, um, an early learning setting, or a library, there are some tips here for change management for tech training, um, some tips on how to really customize training for adult learners. Uh, we also talk about how to develop uh, measurable learning objectives and give you some um, videos along with those as well. That's a free course we have available. And for those of you that have the task of, te of tech planning, which everyone should do but nobody, nobody really wants to do, um, Idealware partnered with TechSoup to bring you, um, it's a four course series. The first course is free and it's an amazing course. Um, there are 11 modules that lead you through the step-by-step -step process of assessing your IT infrastructure. There's a hardware safari. You don't have to wear a hard hat or anything. It's just it's a very it's a great interactive course where you can get the basics to get started for a tech plan for your organization. So we encourage you to go there. And I wanted to see if there were any other questions. Chantal, any other questions? In the yeah, question I, box? I haven't seen specific questions come through, but there are so many comments that are coming through just from uh, listeners who are sharing what they're doing and what they plan to do based on what they've learned today. And I was just typing in that I find this so enriching and so inspiring that people are, are going to share the notes with their colleagues. They're thinking about new programming for their programs and for their libraries. So I think that this was really eye-opening. and. Um, I, I, I appreciate this um, frame, Julie, that you brought to us because I think that this is really a new way of thinking about STEM learning and it has just been so valuable and eye-opening. Oh, yes, and Carol. To say, I hope this is and Yeah, Carol's example is great. I was just writing to her personally. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Julia. You can share her comment. That's a really interesting I, – I think I'd be interested to go with that. Yeah. I, I absolutely would. So Carol Clark from Santa Cruz and Monterey counties uh, talked about how she is using um, like integrating literacy with STEM, um, particularly for dual language learners. So they found Eng Spanish English books on everyone's favorite tool bugs, um, used it in con and, and they used them in uh, in concert with the center gardens. 
Uh, so the librarians introduce the books at the libraries, and then you know the kids can, can kind of go and, and check out Pillbug. Um, they also make sure that parents get library cards, um, and uh, the centers have books through center lending libraries. Um, so there's books at the center garden and garden stuff at the library. Uh, and that's an integrated approach, particularly great for dual language learners, um, you know, who, like all learners, really need to encounter concepts in multiple concept, in multiple contexts in multiple ways. So that's great. And Carol also shared about how they're working with the Monterey Bay Aquarium on um, marine um, marine themed books, and the aquarium mm. is donating free tickets to the the aquarium for families as well. So I love to see that kind of integration of uh, libraries and museums and um, just a, that that whole ecosystem of support for children and families within a community. It's great to see that integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, is, a, is a, a great partner in so many ways. They are one of the, the leading aquariums in, in the initiative we're involved in to, uh, to talk about climate change and its impact um, on, on our ecosystem as well in, in very positive and productive and, and hopeful ways. Um, and they also um, are, um, have, have been engaged in this particular research that I shared today on, on how to make the case for STEM learning and informal STEM learning. Uh, so we've, we've worked with their staff before. So, uh, so Carol, you, you've now got not, not just a, a partner in crime, but a partner in framing as well. Great. Thank you. Well, we do have a lot of wonderful comments. Well, we do hope that um, the folks that are still on the, the call and on the webinar it's important that um, we, we get your feedback today. Um, TechSoup works hard to deliver content like this, and we work with partners like the Early Learning Lab to develop this content and deliver for you. So if you complete the survey that pops up at the end when you X out of this event or when I close the event, there's about 10 questions. If you would please take 60 seconds to answer those so we can continue to deliver wonderful content like this and work with folks like Julie, um, we would really appreciate that. A huge thank you to Chatal and Julie for bringing this amazing content to our collective communities. We hope uh, we can have them both on again uh, in another webinar in the near future. I also want to thank Becky for handling all the chat on the back end, and thanks so much, Becky. And of course, we want to thank ReadyTalk. Um, they are our webinar sponsor. And we hope to see you on an event coming up soon. Please go to TechSoup.org and check out our upcoming events. Remember, all of our webinars are free, and we also have our TechSoup courses you can access. Thanks, and have a great day, everyone.